after quite a while My back against the wall Nowhere to run So here I am again Lord, I'm back again Can't make it on my own My heart is turned around I now face you So here I'm back again Lord, I'm here once more I see your open door I hear the music play And all the servants say Here comes the master, sir So, Lord, I'm back I've paid a heavy price I'll never turn my back on you again Cause I am here to stay
should go home tonight And leave this old world behind I should be free with the love But sad inside Because my friend you're still outside He may just come and take me home Just say me glad to walk another mile with a smile. I could go on running for quite a while. In the heat of day when it's so hot, I feel his shadow cover me like a rock when it You ask me if I'm weary, I am now. Stormy winds may blow and rain may fall, but my Jesus is over all. In the darkest night, I feel his hand. Holding me so gently like a friend who understands Always there to stretch a helping hand Father God, it's such a lovely day that Thou hast made and we determine in our hearts to rejoice whatever the circumstances we may be in, and be glad in it. And once again, as we touch on this troublesome subject, Christian dilemma, we are aware even in the days of the early apostles, there were doctrinal perversions that had been troubling 
the Church of Jesus Christ and your early apostles constantly gave warning to the congregations of those days. And we are also aware that there are some who refuse to see even the weight of the scriptural teachings in the Bible. Father, we pray especially for the lighters that they may love your word, to read your word daily, to get the whole counsel of God, that they may not go astray in their doctrines. So, Father, keep us, we pray. Cover us by the blood of Jesus Christ. And for the next 45 minutes or so, cause our ears to be circumcised, our hearts to be receptive. All this, we pray, giving you thanks. In Jesus' most worthy name, and all the lighters say, Amen. Praise God. This is part five of the Christian dilemma. I'm going to begin by saying what is stated in your link. Words, phrases, and sentences must be clearly defined and put in their proper context and perspectives or else serious misunderstanding can arise and of course the truth could be distorted. I'm going to give you two illustrations this morning before I launch into the content of the message. Now the first illustration, I don't know whether it was just a joke or, you know, it actually happened. It's about a final psychology examination at the end of the year. And the examiner went to the blackboard on that test day and wrote just one word on the blackboard. And the word was why? Question mark. Then he told the students to write an essay on that one word, why? Everybody failed the examination except one student. Although many of them wrote a lot of pages, but this one student wrote two words. Why not? He passed. It's a cute story. I don't suppose it happened, but it illustrates that sometimes things can be extremely subjective. Why? There is no right or wrong answer. You know what I mean? I mean, your answer is as good as mine. Why to what? See, if there is no subject, <clears throat> then anything goes. See, so it's not in a particular context. It's not, you know, objective. Therefore, the whole test, in my opinion, is meaning, meaningless. There should be a context. There should be a subject. If the examiner asks the question, why is there so much suffering in the world? Then there will be an objective answer. Another illustration, and this time I was given the understanding that this actually happened. In another examination, the professor of psychology, before he instructed the students in this examination, when he walked into the class, he took a chair and placed it on top of the table. And then he gave the instruction, now, pretend you do not see the chair. It's not there. Pretend. And you write a thesis. And so, boy, the students wrote pages after pages. And one guy just wrote a couple of words and walked out, handed over to the examiner. He got the highest mark. Now remember the test is the chair on the table, you're not supposed to see it and write an essay on it. And the one that got the highest mark wrote two words. It seems that two words is a good thing. Two words. What chair? <laughs> now, I must say that the whole examination is purposeless. It sounds cute and humorous and interesting, you know what I mean? But it's baseless. 
There is no context whatsoever. We are playing the fool with words. Sounds clever, sounds cute, sounds interesting, sounds human, but utter nonsense. Okay, with that, I launch into the message now. Let's examine one biblical word that is causing a lot of contention today. And that one word is repentance. What is repentance? Now, when you examine this word repentance, you've got to take two things into consideration. Number one, the original meaning in, the, in Bible times. Okay, that's one. Number two, the context of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, even before Jesus came to prepare the, the way, the forerunner, John the Baptist preached one message. Repent. And when Jesus Christ came, he followed up by saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember that. So what is repentance? So if you take into consideration the original meaning in Bible times and the context of the gospel of Jesus Christ, repentance means the following. A radical change of mind and heart in response to Christ who will lead us to a change of conduct and behavior in the process of time. I'm going to say it slow motion now, okay? A radical change of mind and heart in response to Christ who will lead us to a change of conduct and behavior. Not all at once, but in the process of time. Because the process of sanctification will kick in when we receive Christ. We don't become perfect and sinless. We don't. Okay? There will be a process of sanctification. Lately, it has been taught that repentance means a change of mind, period. This is very incorrect and therefore very misleading. Repentance doesn't just mean a change of mind. Let me explain to you. If repentance only means a change of mind, it denigrates Christianity to the level of any religion. Any believer of any religion can say, I have a change of mind. Last time I hated this religion. Now I love it. Are you getting it? Any re religionist can say it. I have a change of mind. And that's all that is required. No change of lifestyle. No change of behavior. Just a change of mind. I... I didn't like this religion, but now I like it. My mind is changed. You know? Yes, it includes a change of mind. It also includes a change of heart. It also includes a process you are got to go through. Christianity is unique. Why? Because Jesus is unique. The bottom line is transformation. And, and transformation needs a process of sanctification. Now, the previous lesson, we discovered that Simon the ex-sorcerer believed the gospel that Philip the evangelist preached. And he followed Philip. Didn't practice sorcery anymore. But he was in the process of sanctification. He still could make mistakes. Some old desires could still come back, but he had to be checked and corrected. So the, the apostles expected him not only a change of mind in him, but also a change of heart and a change of behavior. And when Simon coveted wrongly, wanted to pay them money so that he also could have the gift of laying on hands of people and they could receive the Holy Ghost, Peter rebuked him in very severe terms. You see, 
But the, the apostles didn't say, oh, it's okay, you, 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 you have already a change of mind. You didn't like Christianity, now you follow us. And then besides, you know, we believe after salvation, you don't have to repent. So it's okay, you go on your merry way. No, nope. Peter didn't allow him to go on. He said, you and your money would perish if you go on like that. Today, we will say, oh, so judgmental. Whether it's judgmental or not should be weighed in the context of whether it's in the Bible. Do you understand? If you judge according to the Bible, you're not judgmental. But if it's not in the Bible, then it's your own philosophy. It's your own assessment, you see. So Peter didn't let Simon get away with it. What if Simon didn't repent? Okay, here's my answer. If he didn't repent, it doesn't mean that he would lose his salvation immediately. But let him not push the envelope too far. Are you getting it? Horrible things can happen if a person doesn't want to repent when he knows he's wrong. It's all in the Bible. Okay, let's come to clarification of spiritual terminologies. We have defined the word repentance. Now you know the full scope, not just a change of mind. It's a radical change of mind, a heart and, and behavior and conduct and so forth. Okay, there are two spiritual terminologies we have to grapple with. Number one, under the law. What do we mean when we say under the law? Because it could mean many things to many people, right? To one person, it means, uh, you know, you should not apply the Old Testament laws related to Jews like circumcision and all that to one person. To another person, it means you should even obey the Ten Commandments. Do you, do you see? I, I'll give you the different shades of meaning. But there must be a standardized understanding of what under the law means in the New Testament. Of course, in the Old Testament, it's a different ballgame altogether. So, under the law simply means under the Old Covenant stipulations. Okay? What are those? That the high priest once a year would enter into the Holy of Holies and intercede for the sins of the people just once a year the high priest. And in, in the Old Covenant, they had to operate under the Old Testament animal sacrificial system for remission of sin. It would be terrible if we practice today. Each of us bring a sheep to be slaughtered in the two churches we have for the remission of sin. But that was the Old covenant, under the law, you see. And by the time the scribes and Pharisees came into play, they corrupted what was already very cumbersome, some of the laws. You know, when we talk about the law, we got to understand not just the Ten Commandments. The Jews had also silver laws, you know. Uh, laws about their squabbles, judicial laws. They also have ceremonial laws, how to upkeep the temple, how to behave inside the temple, what to wear in the temple. Now, these are the laws we are not under. Do we pass a cup with a long rope, you know, like in the Old Testament days? No, not applicable to us. But keep in mind, the Ten Commandments are very relevant. Okay, but things pertaining to the Jewish laws, not even the Jews observe them today. But when the, when the scribes and Pharisees began to add on their own man-made laws and rules and regulations and traditions, it clouded the whole issue. So it evolved into not only living under the old covenant Stipulations when we say under the law, it also means this, trusting oneself to keep the law in order to earn salvation. And we oppose to that. 
The, the early apostles opposed to that, that you cannot trust yourself to keep the law fully in order you can have salvation. See the point? So, to get a proper perspective of the law, I must tell you all these things. No one can keep the law 100%. Nobody, there's not one single man except Christ. Nobody else can. And the Bible says that if you break one point of the law, you break the entire law. Now well, that makes it worse. Right? Nobody can keep the law. So you cannot be saved by good works. It's impossible. You don't come to Christ and say, you know, because of my good conduct, I'm able to come before you. No. You have not kept the law. So the law, according to the Bible, is a schoolmaster, not a saviour. The law can never save you. The law can only point to you how wrong you have been. The, the law isn't meant to save us. The law is like a schoolmaster correcting us. So, except for the Ten Commandments, there are many laws not applicable to Gentiles like us. One rule is circumcision. And Paul was so against for we Gentiles to keep this rule. Can you ever imagine we guys got to be circumcised? You know? So Paul fought for us 2,000 years ago. But the Jewish fanatic said, no, Jew or non-Jew all go through circumcision. If you don't go through circumcision, your salvation is being questioned. Now that is under the law. You know, Paul was so angry. You know what Paul said? You can read it for yourself, really. Paul sometimes could be very crude. He said, if you guys, and he, he cited us, you know, guys, Paul helped us, actually. He told the Jewish people, you think that cutting a piece of a flesh is very spiritual? You think so? Then cut the whole thing off, lah, he said. Excuse me, but that's in the Bible. He used emasculate. Just cut, cut it off. If you think cutting a piece of flesh is so spiritual. And of course, when I read it, I say, Amen, Amen, Paul. Wherever you are in heaven, I'm with you, you know. Praise God. Ah, that is under the law, you see. But it doesn't mean that the Ten Commandments uh, something adverse to us now that we are new creation in Christ. Let me give you an example. The fifth commandment says, honour your father and mother that you may live long. Doesn't apply to us? What, what do you think? What about the eighth commandment? Thou shalt not steal. Does it not apply to us? See the point. Supposing a, a young believer comes to you, just received the Lord last night at the miracle service, and say, hey, brother or sister, you know, I received Christ last night at the miracle service, but I'm still struggling with my urges, ungodly urges. You know, I, I, I want to honour my parents from now on, but I've got to work at it. You know, I got to crucify my flesh. I got to deliberately try to be nice to them. And also, I have this habit of when I go to shopping center, I just want to steal. What do you say now? Do you say, mm, don't worry about that, you know, we are not under the law anymore. What, 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 what do you think? Or do you, do you say, yeah, you got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what the Bible says. But it doesn't mean that you have the urges in you, you are not saved. You are saved. Your spirit is saved. Now, you got to surrender your mind. Read the Word of God. Renew your mind with the Word of God. you got to crucify your flesh. This urges to, to be rude to your parents. You know, this, this urge to steal, crucify it. Just don't do, deny yourself. Which one is more scriptural? Oh, you're not under the law anymore. Never mind. So you see, the, we got to define what is under the law. We are no longer under a lot of Jewish laws. 
And we mustn't think that, oh, we can keep the law perfectly, then I'll be saved. No, that's the attitude of being under the law. You cannot be saved by good works. But after being saved, then you say, Lord, I'm in a process of sanctification. Those bad urges doesn't mean I'm not saved. It simply means I have to crucify my flesh. I got to deny myself. But the law, the Ten Commandments are still very relevant. In fact, if you want to have a long life, what does the Bible say? Honour your father and your mother. It's a commandment with a promise. Okay, so we get under the law, out of way, now under grace. What does it mean, under grace? Okay. Now, it means now we are under the new covenant stipulations. There's a big contrast between under the law and under grace. In the Old Testament, a great, a, a, the high priest would represent you, would intercede for you, for you. But now Jesus Christ is our great high priest. He intercedes for us not once a year, every day. Okay. You read it in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. He's our great high priest. He's touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Therefore, he says, you can now come boldly unto the throne of grace. In the Old Testament, only the high priest can approach God directly in the Holy of Holies once a year. Today, we can come into the Holy of Holies 10 times, 20 times, 30 times a day right into the Holy of Holies with Jesus Christ interceding for us. Big difference under grace. See? And we are going through the process of sanctification. We need a lot of help because we are still struggling. Right? Or when you are born again, no struggles. Now you, you make up your mind. Let's be very real and yet scriptural. We all struggle. And when we struggle, it doesn't mean that we are not safe. It simply means we are in the process of training. We are not perfected. We are being in the process of being perfected, but we are not perfect yet. And that's why 1 John 1, 9 is so important, that we must resort to it. Now, we don't need an animal sacrifice. When we sin, who is our once and for all sacrifice? Jesus. So we come to him with 1 John 1, 9. And Jesus, because of his grace, is actively strengthening us when we are mindful to give him all the honour. We keep trusting him and keep receiving his enablement to conquer sin. To sum it all up, under grace means we, we receive his unmerited favour, favour that we don't deserve as He gives us the enablement to live right. But just to define grace as unmerited favour, full stop, is incomplete. It's unmerited favour plus the enablement to do right. Then you have the complete picture. Do you understand? No nonsense. Don't put a chair on the table and say, pretend you don't see it and write an essay on it. We don't play games. We want the perspective of God's Word. So under grace doesn't mean you are exempted from the Ten Commandments. But it doesn't mean that when you fail one of the commandments, you are going to hell. No, it doesn't mean that too. But it simply means you've got to resort to 1 John 1, 9. You see the point? So, in summary, you can never be saved by good works. Never. But when you get saved through the blood of Jesus and because of your faith in God, God puts you through a process of sanctification that you have to ask God to forgive you each time you have hurt somebody or broken His law. He will forgive you freely, you know. So there is a two-way cooperation. God 
and you. I've often stressed this, a basic theological principle. There's always a God word and a man word. God initiated His plans to help us, but we respond and cooperate it, you know, so that we don't get confused. It's not all God. It's not all us. It's always two. Let me show you one verse. Galatians 20. Sorry, Galatians 2 verse 20. Now, Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Now, let's say a person stops there. Okay, at salvation, I'm crucified with Christ, whatever that means. No longer I who live, Christ lives in me. Now, you can go into all kinds of weird doctrines. Oh, no longer I that live, Christ lives in me. That means everything now I say and do, it is Jesus. I can never do anything wrong. You know, because no longer I live, they live what? Jesus lives in me. So it is his responsibility. Yeah, but then you read on. Okay? He said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Then listen to the next part. And the life which I now live. Now, who is doing the living? Now, keep, keep the God word and man word in mind so you don't get confused. Who, who is really doing the living? In the same breath, he says, no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, is he skis for or what? Why does he talk like that? You know? Okay, let, let's read the whole thing, okay, with that perspective. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, I must do the living, although I receive Christ. And I know Christ is in me. But I got to live according to the Word of God. Is it possible there are times I go wrong? Oh yeah, I got to come back. But by and large, I'm doing the living, but I allow Him to empower me to do the living. I'm willing to cooperate. I'm willing to listen to Him. So, in the ordinary affairs, like coming to church, you know, I, I have no problems. But let's say I'm a drinker or was a drinker. And now every time I pass by some lounges and all that, I'm tempted. Then I got to be aware of this. I'm doing the living. I cannot say no longer I the live, Christ live in me and my feet takes me for a drink and I say, it's Jesus in me. It's okay. No, it's not okay. You cooperate with Christ and say, no, I crucified my flesh. I'm going to turn my back. You know, I'm not going to drink. I'm going to go home. And that's how you live. And when you do that, when you make that determination, it's not self-performance. When you make that determination, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you the strength to do it. So it's never all God, never all you. It is you taking the step of faith to do what is right according to God's Word and His enablement will help you. Are you going to do it perfectly? No. Even if you fall, what do you do? Proviso. 1 John 1, 9. And then get up again. That's the real world. That's the real life, isn't it? Lately, I read an article over the net about revival. And revival always comes when people are repenting of their complacency and compromises. That even the pastors, you know, that they have been distracted and the love for soul has waned and, 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 and they would do soul searching. They would have prolonged prayer and fasting and they would, they would confession, they admit the thought to one another. Do you know how, that's how revival start? You know, where members go to each other and say, look, I, I hurt you, I, I know but my pride would not allow me to apologize to you. But now God has convicted me and I'm apologizing to you. And when people begin to amend their relationship and also parents and children are making up, there are lots of problems in Christian homes sometimes. And they are, you know, 
embracing each other, forgiving each other, then a revival will break loose. So I was really very encouraged by that article. Now, as you know, many times at the end of the article, you have all the netizens coming with their comments. And there are quite a few of these people who raise objection to, to this praying and fasting and, and, and you know, and, and they would label it, oh, this is under the law. All this, you've got to fast, you've got to pray, you've got to confess to one another. This all legalism, they say. Self-effort and performance. You don't have to. Jesus done it all. And I said, what strange doctrine are these Christians believing? People are experiencing revival in their churches. And here's this group of people saying that this is all under the law. Self-performance that do not please Jesus is works. Hey, they are not praying to be saved. They are praying for a cleansing and for their purity and power to reach out to the non-Christian. They know they are saved even though they have messed up. They, they knew they, they, they are saved. But they are saying that we're going to prepare ourselves. We're going to be cleansed, totally cleansed. Then we can reach out with purity and with power. And this group of people say, under the law, legalism, self-effort, performance. You see, it's a very confusing Christendom we are living in right now. Now, every time you hear some cute little phrases, you have to be careful. I'm sure you have heard people say, religion say do. Christianity say done. I'm sure you heard about this. Now, we've got to be very careful. There is truth in it, but you got to get the right end of the stick. You get the wrong end of the stick, you will behave wrongly. Okay, let, let's take this, this cute sentence. Religion say do. Christianity say done. Now, this is based on when Jesus died on the cross. He said, it is finished, done. Okay? His sacrificial work on the cross is done. Now, if you come and believe Him, you are saved. Done. It's a done deal. That's what it means. But when you become saved, many things you have to do. Or don't you? Are you getting it? So, you've got a different shape between coming to Jesus for salvation and after you have come for salvation, you are born again. Then this cute saying doesn't apply. It applies the first part. Yes, all the religions say, you must do this, you must be good, you must have your good works overpowering your bad works and blah, 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 then you can be saved. But Christianity say, no, God doesn't work that way. You just believe Him, trust Him, and be prepared to follow Him in a narrow way. Done. True. Up to that point. But when you get saved and now you're a born again believer, <laughs> pray for a revival. Legalism. Why are you staying at home moping around? Go and work. Ah, I'm not under the law. <laughs> How convenient is that? Huh? How very convenient. See? Hey, you're going to be faithful to the ministry. You, know? you have committed. Be there promptly. I'm not under the law. How convenient. Are, are, are you getting it now? When is it do and done? In fact, when you become a Christian, there are more things you have to do. You know? But you don't work out your salvation. You just want to please God. Because you're born again. The, the other one is trust and not try. Have you heard it? And again, it's before salvation and after salvation. You know? I don't have to try to be very good that I come. Because that's a fallacy. That's a common behavior amongst non-Christians. I've met friends whom I finally led to the Lord. They kept they keep telling me, hey Ronnie, don't bug me when I'm ready. I say, when are you ready? When I clean up, la, you know. I say, if you can clean up so clean to appear before Jesus, He will not have been messed up on the cross for you. 
You don't try. When you come to Jesus Christ, you don't try to be good and then you come to Jesus. If you try to be good and be acceptable, Jesus would have died on the cross in vain. You just come, just like a prodigal son, in rags and pig smell and all, and say, here I am again. And the Father will receive you. That's exactly what it is, you see. But after you have received Christ, you're going, to be, you're going to try to be faithful. You're going to try to be loyal. You're going to try your best when you're given a job, isn't it? You don't say, I just try. You know, I don't try. This slogan doesn't apply. But before you receive Christ, yes, it applies. You cannot try hard enough to be accepted. Come just as you are. But after you have received Christ, you have to trust and obey like we have sung. Right? And to obey is not easy. You've got to keep trying to be more obedient. So be careful when you hear things like that. I've heard one more Love God with all of your heart and you can do anything you want. Sounds very cute. It's like putting a chair on the table and say, it's not there. Okay, let's examine it. Love God with all of your heart and you can do anything you want. How is a person going to measure love God with all of your heart? A very wishy-washy Christian could be misled to believe that he's loving God with all of his heart. And he can do what he wants. Love God with all of your heart and then you can do what you want. <laughs> we got to be very careful. You see, like the other week I said, Paul said, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Then on the other hand, he said, you know, I buffet my body. I keep my body under. Lest I preach to other people, I myself become an outcast. See, there's a balance. You see. So, if a pastor like myself, and weekly we minister to thousands, and there are many people in different levels, and some of the statement like, love God with all of your heart, and you can do anything you want. The very matured ones, they, they have no problems because they, they love God with all of their hearts. They do not want to do wrong. They know it's meaningful to them. But what about the spiritual abings and akaos and ati? Now, sorry, I don't have proper words, so I'm using that. What about those who are not committed and they feel that they are loving God with all of their heart and I can do what I want? See? It's very dangerous to make cute slogans, convenient slogans that tickles the ear, but it does not cater to everybody. If I make a statement like, oh, you're a Christian, oh, nothing can separate you from the love of God. It is true to, to Paul. It is true to some of you very committed Christians. Can it be true to somebody who is in and out, in and out, in and out? Are you getting the whole picture now? that we preachers have such a, an awesome responsibility that one day when we stand before Jesus Christ, we are going to be judged more severely than the people in the pews. Now you think about it. Okay, we mustn't confuse God's work of justification with our cooperation in sanctification. I'm going to repeat that again. We must never confuse God's work of justification with our cooperation in sanctification. You put these two together and lump them together and confuse them, you'll be a whole embodiment of confusion. Not only you are going to confuse yourself, you're going to confuse everybody else. Now let me give you, in closing, seven scriptural texts about our faith in action. Seven scriptural texts about our faith in action. I trust some of you are taking notes so that, you know, you always have an answer 
when people are confused and you are able to contend for the faith. Let, let me get to the first one. First John 3, 3. Okay, these are verses that would express our faith in action. That means not just date faith and say God does it all, but we have a part to play. First John 3, 3 says, and everyone who has this hope in him, in Jesus, purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. Okay, question. Who takes the action towards purification? Who takes the action towards being pure? You and I, right? God is not going to take any action. He has already done all he could in provision. But we take the action to purify ourselves. Now, why must we purify ourselves? Well, in this short verse, two reasons. Firstly, because He's pure. We've got to be like Him, right? And secondly, we have this great hope in Him. It's worthy of us being pure. Okay, then how do we purify ourselves? Now, when the Bible says, as a Christian, you purify yourself, it simply means, even as a Christian, you do a, uh, right? Then you're going to purify yourself. How do you purify yourself? First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, He is just and faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Right? So here again, you see a God word, you see a man word. God is very willing to forgive. But we have to do something. Okay, the second passage, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Same question. Who must take the action towards cleansing? I think you know the answer, isn't it? You got to do it for your life. I got to do it for my life. Cleanse ourselves. Why do we have to cleanse ourselves? That's the way to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. And because we have, have these wonderful promises also. So, how do we do this cleansing? And the word cleansing presupposes that a Christian, although you are born again, Christ is in you, you do get dirty, unclean, soiled. Right? If not, what for cleansing for Christians? So how do we cleanse ourselves? First John 1 John 1.9 offers us to come to receive forgiveness and He will forgive. And that is grace. Plenty of grace. Then the third scripture portion, Galatians 5.24. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who are Christ's, or those who belong to Christ, have Crucify the flesh with its passion. That means the evil passion and evil desire. You know, so same question. Who does the crucifying of the flesh? You do it. I do it. Perhaps I should explain to you, how do we crucify the flesh? You know, we just deny ourselves. That's Crucifying the flesh. Something you long to do but it's wrong. You don't do. See, you ask God to help you. And, and I know many times you ask God to, to help you. It doesn't mean like magic. Oh, I don't have that desire anymore. No, it will still persist. So what do you do? You force yourself. You crucify. The flesh. That's what Paul says. 
you know, I, 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 I put my body under lest I declare to others I myself become an outcast. You just don't. And God will help you in the process of time. It works like this, really. Let's say if you have a habit of drinking, alcohol, of course, not fruit juice. And you have that habit, and of course the temptation will come. Okay, the first time you crucify yourself, and you say no, you walk away. Tough. Although you pray, Lord, help me, it, it looks like there is no help. But you tear yourself away from the bottle. Then you do it again and again the same way. By the 11th, 10th time, it's easier. The same with all the kinds of habits. It's the same. Is it easy? No. You see, that's the reason why I believe. I'm trying to understand, why do these American preachers export all this distorted grace to all the nations and people, you know, bite them? Why? Because it's hard to live a holy life. It takes effort. So now they come out, well, you put effort or oh, you're not trusting Christ. You're living under the law. You don't try. Are you seeing why all this come into play now? You know? So, to say that Christ, being a Christian is easy is a lie. It is not. I think all of you found that out. Right? I mean, when I was a non-Christian, even when I was wrong and I argued and, you know, became ugly about it, I walk away without saying sorry. And I didn't feel anything after a while. But as a Christian, if I behave like that, you know, I would have this uneasiness. I, I somehow would have to come to this person and say, look, I was off color, you know. I, I mean, the pride is still there, but at least I say, look, I, I wasn't myself, you know, please excuse me. Even if I don't say the word forgive me, I use another word. Yeah. There's a difference now because you are held more accountable when you are a Christian. So it's not easy. So I'm sure Christians try to find loopholes in the law, like people filling up the income tax. Professional will tell you there are legal loopholes. So I'm afraid Christians are trying to find legal loopholes. Yeah. But hey, the Word of God has no loopholes. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you seven portions of the Scripture. There are much more. Much, much more. That's why to those who have embraced this teaching, I always say, you read a lot of scripture, scripture passages, do you feel uneasy sometimes? Because some, one guy told me, oh, I, you know, I always believe like those preachers say, let us deal with love. God is God of love. Yeah. I say, okay. Have you read your Bible regularly? And find, have you ever find passages that you wonder, hey, how come God behaved like that? You say, yes, many times. I try not to read them. But you have to read them. You cannot escape them. You see? If you want to be honest with this book, you must also take in a lot of things that we have a problem with. I have some problems. And I always say, Lord, I may not understand it. I may not know that situation that happened in Bible times. But I know you're a good God. It didn't come out like that as so, but I still trust you, Lord. I still believe. You know? But if those people were to repent, I know you would have taken them back. I know that. But they did not. See, I always come back to this point that when you ask God to forgive you, He will. And what is that? Grace. We don't have to twist it. It's pure grace. Now, Ephesians 4, 20 to 24. But you have not so learned Christ. That means to some Ephesians, Paul said, you have not learned the ways of Christ yet. You're not like becoming like him. Yeah. Many times you hear Paul 
preach like that. He's not a quote and unquote grace teacher. You know what I mean? Everything must sound nice. No. Say, you have not learned Christ yet. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ, that you put off concerning your former conduct, that is the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. See, not very nice, right? Do people want to preach this? No. But you see, I'm very aware when I read verses like this, and I don't mind telling you, sometimes when I read some verses, especially in the Old Testament, and I say, Lord, I, I don't know how I'm going to preach that. You know. How, how am I going to tell my lighters this part? But in my, in my heart of hearts, I know one day God is going to ask me a question when we are all there. Have you declared that portion of Scripture to your congregation? <clears throat> I would rather be able to say, yes, Lord. And I'm sure God would ask you after my responsibility is done, that he'll ask you a question also. Have you heard Pastor Ronnie tell you that in this verse? You see, we are all responsible. So put off the old conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. What does it mean? Now, we are born again. Why talk about grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. That's our past life, right? And these are all to Christians. Well, the explanation is simple. When you keep on putting off the old conduct, I refuse to entertain, then you will grow more and more like Christ. But if you do not obey the Bible by putting off the old conduct, the former conduct, the old man, the human tendency, despite the fact that you are born again in the Spirit, because what, what, what did I tell you? You're born again in the Spirit. What must you do to your mind? Because your mind will still be the same if you don't do anything to it. Now, the, the grace of God gives you the accessibility, the access into the means to be holy in the mind. So what do you do? You're going to conform your mind to the Word of God. You're going to put off the old man. If you do not, the tendency of the flesh, remember the born again experience is not in your flesh. And that's a comfort really. I tell you what, what a comfort is. Now many of you have been Christians for some time, right? Are there times that you've the flesh, the urges of the flesh, you want to do something wrong? Come and be honest about it. In your heart of hearts, if you be honest, you'll say, yes, there are times I still have urges, right, of unrighteousness. You know. Then what, what does the Bible tell you? Don't fulfill it. Put off. Are you, are you getting it? You see how real it is to real life? You see, I'm not dealing with airy-fairy theories and sound nice slogans. But this is real. But if you don't put off the old man as a matter of habit, what is going to happen? It grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Now, I know in your heart, you know that is true. Even if you don't agree with me, because we like always to believe the best. But it's in the Word of God. It's staring you in the face right now. Verse 23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you must do. How? Read the Word of God. 24, And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Now, I don't have to tell you in this passage who is the one that is going to put off the old man, put on the new man, renew the spirit of the mind. You know the answer. 
We are all responsible. But God is going to help us when we actively do that. You see? Okay, how do we put on the new man? Now, put off, we know. We crucify the flesh. We don't allow it expression. We, we deny it ourselves. But how do we put on a new man? We do right when we know it is right, although we don't feel like doing right. That's putting on a new man. I remember years ago, when God told me to do something nice for the neighbor who treated me shabbily, I rebelled in my heart. I was coming back from Bible school and, you know, and this neighbor was at the veranda. He pretended not to see me. I also pretended not to see him. It's a very sad way to live, by the way. If you have neighbors and every time you pass each other, you know, and especially in a lift when it's enclosed and the whole family is there and you know, there's some problem going on, they push the lift and they come. You don't know where to look or where to put, you know, and it's your neighbor. Sad. It happened to me because I witnessed to his son, he's from another, you know, religion and he got mad at me and, and I thought I was right. I thought I was being persecuted for righteousness sake. So, you know, he should apologize to me. But God said, do something nice for him. And God told me, you know, specifically, Actually, my brother bought me some nice T-shirt and God said, give it to him. I said, you've got to be kidding. You know, give it, of all people, give it to him. But I tell you, the Lord would not let go. And I said, okay, God, if 20 minutes from now, I'm going to dilly-dally, put my back down, wash up and all that. If he's still there, I would do it. You won't believe it, I tell you. Because nobody would stand at the, veran uh, the common balcony, common veranda stand there for 20 minutes who, who would do that even you have a balcony people hardly sit at the balcony you know so very confidently after 20 minutes I open up lo and behold it was still there I got to put on the new man you see I got to put off the old man the, 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 the anger the hurt feeling I got to put off, crucify myself, eat humble pie, get rid of my pride, put on the new man. And I went to him, called him by name, gave it to him. I thought he almost died. I thought. He looked as though am I dreaming. But you know, from that day, it was so beautiful. Hi, morning. Where, where are you going? You know, instead of Sad way to live. Very sad. So it looks like some of you might have to put off. You see, such teaching, who likes such teaching? You know what I mean? You know? You, know? you see, people will like just generous slogan. Never mind, anything that happened, you know, just say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And you see, you know, you see your name, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. You see the difference now? You talk about the balance of Scripture. You know, we have heavy responsibilities. Very heavy. But when you conquer it by Christ's power, not self-effort, you trust God to do it. Do you know what a happy environment? You know what it is to be free? When you're able to look at your neighbor's face, whom you have not been talking for months, and able to say, hey, hey, hi, where are you going? Everything okay, you know? What a nice feeling, you see? There's such a reward, really, to be at peace with your neighbours, you know? And, and verse 24 says, in true righteousness and holiness, you know? Why should we do all that? Because we have been created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And the, the Bible put the word true, true righteousness. Why true? Not just talk only. <laughs> it's really righteous. You know? It's so nice to be able to say, yeah, God loved me so much, I've been forgiven. And really, when I accepted Christ, 
I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. That is a fact. That is scriptural truth. Then when I lift it out, it's true righteousness. Okay, fifth portion now. Acts 26, 19 to 20. Paul was standing in front of King Agrippa. Okay. And uh, he was fighting for his life, really, because he was being falsely accused and all that. And in this passage, he was giving King Agrippa a kind of job description as a, as a minister of God. So he stood there and said, Therefore, King Agrippa, in Acts 26, 19 to 20, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem, this is my job, I preach the gospel to those in Damascus, in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. And this is what I actually declare, Paul told the king, that they should repent, turn to God. So people who did not know God, they have to repent, turn to God. Then after they have known God, and to do works befitting repentance. I'm going to explain. What does it mean to do works befitting repentance? Meaning, now that you have been forgiven by Christ, declare righteous. Now you begin to conduct yourself. You begin to do good works that is befitting a Christian, a born again Christian who had truly repented. Are good works important? After salvation, is expected of you. But before salvation, you cannot do enough good works to get saved because you cannot. There is no good works that accumulated will become a total aggregate that deserve a pass. No, nobody can pass the test. You've got to go through Christ, not good works through Christ. But after good works, you show yourself with good works befitting repentance. In fact, a true Christian, how, how would you know a person is a true Christian? By the fruits, you shall know him, isn't it? And what are the fruits? His behaviour, his good works. Right? Not, not just his words. Words are cheap. Okay. But this is all Bible. Then the next passage, Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Matthew 5, 17 to 19 will seal it all. You know, whether or not we should disregard the Ten Commandments at all. We should not. We only disregard Jewish traditions, customs that are not applicable. Circumcision, all the festivals they they had not applicable to us. There may be some meanings that we can take to use, but they are not. We don't have to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle and, and, and all that. We don't have to, see? And all the, uh, you know, the, the, the other laws, like ceremonial laws, not applicable. We don't live under the law. But the Ten Commandments, very relevant to us. Okay, verse 17 always. Do not think, Jesus is saying, that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's very clear, isn't it? You know? I don't come and destroy. I don't come and destroy so that you guys can say, oh, we are not under the law. It's not applicable. And we don't have to honour our parents. We don't, you know, it's under the law. You see... I believe these American preachers are working themselves in a hopeless contradiction. So ridiculous that, do you know, every time I come up to, I'm, I'm trying to get this over man with me. Maybe there's one more session so that I give you a full treatment. I'm looking forward, I can tell you honest, I'm looking forward to declare to you, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I can do all things through Christ. I'm more than a... I want to get back to that kind of preaching. Yeah. But that kind of preaching will be very good when we have this at its background that we cannot take things for granted. Are you getting me? You know? But those kind of preaching will be very bad if you don't have this as a background. You can swing over to the deep end. 
and get yourself into a lot of trouble. Verse 18, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tether will not by, means, by any means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. This is just to emphasize that even, you know, after the end times and God have an extreme makeover of, of the, the, the planetary space and our immediate earth and all that, not a little tiny portion of the word of God or the law will pass away. It will. You see? Then verse 19. And verse, verse 19 is very interesting. It says, Whoever therefore breaks one, just one, of the least of these commandments, and the worst thing is, and teaches others to do so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of God. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of God. All right. I don't think it needs explanation. Simply put, we have to obey God's law even after we are born again. But we don't obey so that, oh, I'm, I'm fearful that I'll lose my salvation. No, we obey because we long to be like God. We long to be like Christ. And if we slip, come back. First John 1, 9. Are you getting the picture? And not with disregard, you know. Okay, Jude 4 now. Let's look at Jude 4. It's getting closer to home, actually. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Did you hear that part? They pervert the grace of God. You see, the grace of God is so wonderful. And it's easily misunderstood because it's so generous. It's easily misunderstood and taken for granted. That in the book of Jude, the Lord tells us that be careful not to pervert this grace of God into a license for immorality. And that would be denying Jesus Christ. How, how do we deny Christ? I tell you, people think that deny Christ is to say, I don't know Jesus. I don't believe in Him. No, to deny Christ is to deny submitting to His Lordship. I don't care whether you are attending church faithfully, never miss a Sunday. But you have not submitted to His Lordship in matters of gravity like sin and repentance. And you refuse to repent when you commit a sin. Are you submitting to His Lordship? Are you not actually denying His Lordship over you? The Bible is very clear. When you sin, what do you do? You repent. You confess. And what would he do? He will cleanse. He will forgive. But he said, no, I don't believe that. Then you mean you are submitted to the Lordship of Christ? No. And then if you teach others to do the same as you, it's even worse. I would recommend some of, I, I know many of you are, are very clear. I, I know some of you are kind of, hey, how come when I hear that you know, have you ever been to a debate? You know? And especially you're not prepared on the topic. You, you, you heard the topic for the first time and you go to a debate and you listen, the proposition. And the tendency, because these are the best picked by the schools, you know. The tendency for you to listen to the proposition is, yeah, mm, yeah, amen. I can say amen, although it's not a church. Mm, yep, yep, yep. Ah. Oh. That's good, good speaker. So the opposition comes along. Amazingly, you say the same thing, you hear? Eh? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Mm, I agree. Then in the end, you say, I agree with both proposition and opposition. And it's because you do not know the subject well. You are taken by slogans 
and so forth. And especially both sides don't show you statistics or a base. In, in church, of course, what is it based on? Not a good feeling. Not what I like to hear. What is it based on? The Word. Are you getting it? You know? Slogans, like I said, can be very deceiving, like I demonstrated early on in the message. Slogans can sway you to the extreme. But it must be the Word. Do you know how many portions of Scriptures I've been giving in the five messages already? An amazing amount, and yet I have to cut off so many to keep it in a manageable proportion. So I would encourage you, read whatever you want to on the other side. Just read widely. Okay? Take down every point. Then this, the Word of God that I show you, you read through. Just read through the Word of God that I show you. I dare say that if you do that, the truth will set you free. Absolutely. Guaranteed. It's the word of God. Okay. Okay, in closing. But then your seatbelt, we are going to learn now. First Peter, second chapter, 15 to 16. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, see, after being born again, you've got to do good. You know, not under the law because you, you do good works. No, it's not. You know, but you do good with the help of Christ. That by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. In the community, let them say good things about us through our good works. That's what Paul is saying. And it's free. Yet we have liberty, but the right kind of liberty. You see, liberty is very tricky. I think those of you who have stayed with me many years, you often hear me use this illustration. The train is free to run as long as it runs on the track. Keep that in mind. Okay? Liberty doesn't mean no boundaries. Do you, do you get me? Liberty is freedom under protection. Liberty for all. So if somebody has a liberty of speech, let's say, and he can only see his side and the other side cannot say anything, you know, and he insists that his is right, it's not liberty. You know, both sides must have their say and let the people decide. You know, the Americans, for instance, they say, we're the land of the free, we... You know, we would, you know, publish anything. People have a right to say. And then when they falsely accuse, let's say, certain habits of Singapore, and we give a right of reply, they refuse to publish it. That is not freedom. You see the point? If you believe in freedom, then you give the right of rebutter. Okay? And let the people decide whether we Singaporeans are under the law, you know, we, we are suffering, you know, we are very tightly controlled, you know. Now, I know some of you believe that it's okay, we are in a land of free, okay? So, it's a very strange thing when we talk about freedom, you know. Let me say another principle. Freedom that is absolutely free is lawlessness. Now, keep my two statements in mind. The train is free to run provided it runs on its track. It's freedom for the train. Okay? Perimeters. Freedom that is absolutely free is lawlessness. You see, how come? You know, in Singapore, we have this X-rated censorship. You know, we want more. We want to have our own idea of things and so forth. You know, we want to be absolutely free. Well, let, 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 let's, let me put this this way. Let's say tomorrow the government declare. Tomorrow is a total freedom day. You can do what you want. No law will go after you. You know something? I will go to Johor Bahru tomorrow. I don't want to stay in Singapore. It's so free. Anyone can do anything, the law will not catch up with you. Can you imagine what is going to happen? 
Free what? It's a free world. You can do anything. We declare freedom. Freedom for everybody. The tricky thing about freedom is we have to take everybody's freedom into consideration. See? Your freedom to enjoy at the expense of somebody's bondage and misery is not freedom. Are you getting it? So also the teaching of God's abundant love, abundant grace, you cannot push to the extreme. It will be a train not running on its track. It will be a day of total freedom that you can do what you want. There has to be parameters. And our parameters is the word of God, as I show you the seven passages. So here Peter is saying that we're going to do good works so that people will know, you know, and, and we will silence their, 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 their talk about us. And then we must be free, but yet with perimeters in verse 16, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice. Don't use freedom to cover up your secret sins. We are free. It's abundant grace. We are free, you know. Don't use that. It's in the Bible. Don't use your freedom or the speech of freedom that we are so free in Christ. Keep in mind what I say. Freedom must have, have parameters. Because if not, then we come to this ultimate conclusion. Let's say, God's love. And I ask you a question. How deep is God's love? Some of you will say, oh, as deep as the ocean. I will say, no, it was deeper than that. See? How deep then? Oh, he is so deep, he, he just forgives, you know. And of course, this is politically correct, you know. Would he forgive everybody? After all, it's unconditional. Yes. He will forgive everybody. Provided, and that's a track now. That's a track now. Provided that they come to Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior. So the outside world, and I don't blame them, they don't see what we see. Then there's no unconditional love. It's conditional. Right? Because if you push this love, unconditional love means God will love everybody, send everybody to heaven, regardless of anything, no condition. Then why am I here preaching the gospel? Why? Everybody is saved what? In fact, I tell you, if I were a cult leader, I, I would build on this. I hope I'm not giving some of you ideas. God is so loving. Nobody will be lost. That's why it's unconditional. So if you Christians say, you come to Christ, then you can be saved. It's conditional one. Now I'll open this all up actually so that you understand how complex a subject we are talking now. Is it conditional or unconditional? i tell you why. We still call it unconditional. Unconditional in this sense. You can be black, you can be white, you can be yellow like me, you can be purple. All have the same chance to come to Jesus. He would not despise you because of your background or your race or your, the level of intelligence. Unconditioned in the fact that anyone who comes to him, he will in no wise cast out unconditional. And if you fall again, you come back again, he'll take you in. Unconditional. You see, you mean a thousand times he'll take me? Yep, a thousand times he'll take you in. Probably you'll die before your thousand times. I know. But he'll take you in. See, that's un... But actually there is this condition of receiving the pardon provided. And this is an overpowering 
Things simply because if I say I have a gift for you, right? Even I say this is unconditional. No strings attached. I give it to you, a gift. But if you refuse to receive it, it won't be yours. Right? It won't be yours. So it's not on my part. I offer it, you don't want it. Then you say, but how can you say unconditional? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's unconditional. But as far as you are concerned, it's conditional. You, you, you don't want it. So you don't get it. So Jesus said, you follow me, I bring you to heaven. If not, you go to hell. Unconditionally come, I don't want. Then go to hell. He said, you put it crudely. Then go to hell. Are you getting it? See, I offer it, it's a free gift. But you don't want it. Like, like a little girl, there was this, this man who, whom the wife brought to church many, many times. He refused to receive Christ. And one day he came reluctantly again. And amazingly, that day he came to the altar. And the pastor was so happy. He thought it was maybe my message so powerful that this heart not to crack, you know, has crumbled down and he, he's receiving crack. And he asked the guy, he said, but which part of my message make you come forward to receive Christ? He said, nothing to do with your message. He said, but how did you come? He said, during the altar call, a little girl came and tucked at my coattail and said, Sir, do you want to go to heaven? He looked at her and said, No. Then she said, Then you will go to hell. He said, Suddenly I felt the reality of heaven and hell. I went out. He accepted the offer, the unconditional love of Christ, he accepted it. Are you getting it? Let me read the last part again. First Peter 2, 15 and 16. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, you are free, but yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice. Don't use the word liberty and give people the excuse not to discipline themselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are saying, wow, a lot of homework to do. How about that? That's Christianity. You've got a lot of work to do. And mind you, you are construction. You, you, you are work under construction. Work in progress. Every Christian ought to wear that sign. Sorry for the inconvenience, work in progress, because we irritate one another. Just like when we, when, when, when we drive through a road and somebody says, work in progress, you know, and then you've got to detour, you got to, you know. But that's who we are, actually. We bear with one another. God bears with us because of His grace, but we are getting better. Shall we bow our heads? Father, I thank you that your word will never return unto thee void. And especially I pray for lighters who are confused. Oh God, they need not be. I pray they will diligently take those verses and they can research themselves and get other verses as well to make sure they understand there is always a God word and a man word. And let every lighter shine the light responsibly, oh Father not only being pure and, and, and powerful and dynamic, but able to share the Word of God with your love and with your firmness. All this we give you thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for joining us online. If you have been blessed and would like to give a love offering to our ministry, you may do so via PayNow or internet banking. You may also mail us your checks at the address below. To keep up to date with us, do follow Pastor Ronnie at the following social media platforms. See you again same time next week.